Okay, this is our last block of lectures before the midterm. However, um, this there will only be a few questions. So this is the topic of learning we're going to be talking about. There will only be a few questions on learning on the midterm. Most of the questions on learning I'll put on the phone. Okay, so um, this is your last chance to hear it, so I wouldn't leave right now. But um, uh, I will only ask a few, and I will ask a few questions, but I won't ask very many. Um, I have various announcements. That's one of them. Second is that the uh, um, Scantron type answer sheets for the uh, neuron and uh, vision uh, study questions uh, should now be posted uh, as of yesterday. I sent you all an email. Um, that one is really, um, you don't have very too long for that because you have to get it done before the midterm. So that one is due at midnight on Wednesday. And then as soon as that um, moment comes, immediately the answers and explanations will autom should automatically get posted. Um, and so you'll want to go over those. Um, learning study questions I will put up um, sometime fairly soon, um, but they will not be assigned. Those will, I'll, I'll put them up and I'll put up answers and you should basically just do them um, and you know, study it when you're ready um, and try to do them. And then, uh, so I'm just thinking about this. No, I, maybe I will post answers, but we won't count them. I'll, I'll put it up so that you can use this business and see which one. You, how many do that? How many do it and see which ones they got right and then go back and do some over? How many do do it that way? Okay, I'll post it again. I'll post it, but it won't be required. I'll have to it. It'll get recorded in the grade book, but we'll just wipe it out. So it's only for your use. And then I'll post. Um, and I'll post the answers and explanations for it straight away. Just don't look at them until you're ready to look at them. Until after you've done it yourself. And I'll probably, I'll post it and I'll just leave it up. There's no reason to take it down because we're not going to count it anyway. Okay. Um, the um, review sessions. Uh, so I should, with any luck, finish this block of lectures by the end of, tomorrow, uh, end of Wednesday. Uh, it might slop a little bit over in Friday, but not very much. Um, and... Um, so we will have a review session on Friday. However, be warned. What I mean by a review session is that you, I will answer questions. No review lectures. Uh, I don't give review lectures because it's, I just don't see any way, how, any way of taking five weeks of material, five weeks worth of material, and giving you, you know, a one-hour lecture that's going to do you any good. So I, I just don't do that. Um, but uh, so come prepared with questions. We will also schedule. Thursday, late Thursday afternoon. Is it scheduled yet? Or? I, I put the request in the five minutes. You put the question in the two. She said she'd do it. Keep on top of her. <laughs> um, uh, we will schedule an additional review session for Thursday late afternoon, but we may not use it. We'll have to, I'll make an announcement about that. In other words, the primary review session will be Friday at class time. But if, uh, especially if I go over and we don't have all that time, uh, and I see we're not going to have all that time after the Wednesday lecture. We may have some time on Thursday afternoon as well. Uh, we'll see. Um, and I don't know where that will be. We're trying to get a room for it. Okay. I guess that's it for announcements. All right. Um, so any issues? Okay. Um, so the last block of lectures is on learning. Uh, neural mechanisms of learning. Um, but it's going to be directed, and you'll learn a lot of general stuff from it. Um, but I'm focusing it to talk about a particular thing, which is kind of important to you guys, um, which is why is it that well-spaced distributed learning is remembered, whereas mass learning is not? Uh, a shaggy, well, whereas mass learning is not? Um, as you all probably realize, at least to some extent, if you cram for something the night before an exam, you actually may do all right on the exam. Um, but um, a month later, you don't remember squat. Um, and um, that is, there are probably a lot of different explanations for that. Some of those explanations are actually biochemical, having to do with the basic mechanism of long-term memory storage in the brain. Um, and so I'm going to direct these, like, I'm going to kind of focus these lectures to tell you that story. And it's very much a scientific shaggy dog story. It's actually a great detective story, but it's very convoluted. Um, and so I'll try to 
keep us all with it as we go. Um, but um, it, it, it takes some strange uh, twists and turns and, and, and uh, digressions. Um, OK, so let me just go over briefly how we're going to proceed here. Because if there are these twists and turns, it can get a little bit confusing. And I'll try to keep this on, on track as we go along. First of all, we're going to talk about the fact, which I've already mentioned to you briefly uh, during the vision lectures, when to, or during the consciousness, discussing consciousness, that there are at least two kinds of learning that are mediated by different brain circuits. Um, I told you there were two kinds of learning, conscious and unconscious. Didn't talk about the brain circuits. We'll do that now. Um, now, um, having introduced those, and it's important to know about those just from a general point of view, um, uh, the kind of learning we're mostly going to be talking about um, in addressing this question of why space practice is better than mass uh, learning, mass practice, um, will be uh, just one of the two kinds of learning, the kind that we call procedural learning. And I'll, I'll, I'll fill that in, in a few minutes. Having introduced these two kinds of learning, we're then going to talk about learning in general. And this applies probably to both these kinds. Um, as asking, what is it that changes in the brain when you learn? Uh, something must change about nerve cells when you learn, more or less by definition. Um, and the question is, what is it that changes? So that's the second thing we're going to do, talk about that. Um, then we are going to talk about the fact that there are major differences in the properties of short and long-term learning. It turns out they're rather different. Um, they probably both involve the same kind of uh, functional changes that we talked about in B, but special things happen, uh, uh, and special re there are special requirements for long-term as opposed to short-term learning. Um, and um, specifically what we find is that long-term learning um, and also the, synapse, the, uh, the neural changes that underlie it both require new protein synthesis. So we'll talk about some of the evidence for that and about the fact that that's true. OK, so protein synthesis, it's not just any protein synthesis, but particular kinds of protein synthesis that are involved in stabilizing memories, if those are involved for long-term change, and if we're interested in the question of how to optimize long-term change, the long-term memory, um, then uh, we need to learn something about the cellular events that set this protein synthesis going. And so that's what we're going to do next. And this is the shaggiest dog part of the shaggy dog story. It's very convoluted. Um, and I think we'll get to the end of that today, probably. Um, and it ends up with the discovery of a particular protein um, that is involved in inducing the synaptic, in, in inducing the protein synthesis, which is, or inducing the uh, um, transcription, um, which leads to the formation of uh, some of the relevant proteins uh, for long-term learning. Um, we're talking about the mechanisms of that. Um, and the particular protein that we're going to discover the, the shaggy dog story discovers is something called cyclic AMP responsive element binding program, pro protein, or short, which is referred to as CRED. So having discovered this stuff, this protein CRED, that's important for uh, uh, inducing uh, protein synthesis that's involved in making long-term memories, um, uh, we're going to show, do some experiments here, uh, talk about some experiments here that show that it really is needed. And then finally, we're going to discover that, in fact, CREB is just one of a family of very similar proteins, CREB1, CREB2, and so on, they have various names. Um, and some of these proteins help learning. Some of these proteins hurt learning. And it's because of this hurting part um, that this um, space practice is better than mass. And I'll explain that. No, that won't, we won't get to that till, uh, till Wednesday. OK, so that's kind of where we're going. OK, first of all, there are two kinds, at least two kinds. There are more than two, but there are two uh, uh, currently very heavily studied kinds of learning, um, which are referred to as declarative or explicit versus procedural, implicit, or habit learning. Um, these, are, they're, these, are, th these terms are used by different people because of different historical contexts, but they all refer more or less approximately to the same thing over here. And here, declarative and explicit learning are also more or less uh, the same thing. Um, now, what are their basic properties? Well, first of all, declarative learning, first of all, the learning usually, though not always, occurs pretty fast, sometimes with only one exposure, but pretty fast. Um, but not always, just usually. Um, secondly, the memories that are formed are conscious. OK? We can actually bring them to mind by thinking about them. Uh, and maybe express them as mental imagery or verbally, you know, we can think about them, we report them. 
And um, for this kind of learning, storage is initially um, substantially in a structure called the hippocampus, which you kind of know where it is from some of the pictures, and I'll show you another picture in a few minutes. Um, but in the hippocampus um, uh, and other uh, medial portions of the temporal lobe. Uh, but eventually, over time, um, over a period of uh, weeks or a month or so in rodents, but over it can go on for as much as a few years in humans, um, these, it is believed that these memories that are initially in the hippocampus move to the cortex. Um, the evidence for that is good, but not perfect. But that's widely believed, very widely believed. Um, we'll talk more about all of that, or somewhat more about all of that. Um, the other kind, procedural implicit learning, first of all, is usually, though not always, relatively slow. In fact, we're going to talk mostly, our, the, the examples that we're going to give of, for various reasons are mostly a procedural learning, and, but we're going to, in fact, talk about a very fast kind of procedural learning. But most kinds of procedural learning are very slow. Um, and um, the uh, content of these memories, as I told you uh, um, last time, um, is unconscious. In other words, you don't know whether you know it. You only find out about it in performance. You, you may do something as a result of it, but you don't, it doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a conscious memory. But there's obviously some storage in your brain that's responsible for the fact that you're behaving differently than you did before to a given uh, stimulus or event. This kind of learning, in this kind, for this kind of learning, the storage is substantially in basal ganglion structures, especially this tree and probably other places too. But it's, extensive, it's, it's, it's not in the hippocampus, it's in other places, uh, mostly in the basal ganglion. Now, this next slide is uh, kind of says the same thing, but spells out some of the details. Um, OK, first of all, again, declarative, episodic, explicit, procedural, implicit habit. One on the left, one on the right. Um, this one, you can bring, to memory, bring memory to consciousness. This one is manifest only in performance. That's what I already just said. Now, exactly what kinds of memories or learning are examples of each of these two types are a little bit different for people and uh, animals, um, and in particular, different for people and the rodents that are what usually get studied in, in, uh, in animal experiments. In people, um, declarative learning, examples would be uh, learning uh, rec to recognize faces, learning to remember the names of people that you've met, uh, remembering where you parked your car last night, what, what you, or where you parked your car this morning, uh, where, what you had for dinner <coughs> last night. Um, these last two are examples of what are called episodic memory or episodic learning, and they are typically things that only happen once, so by definition they're fast. So, you know, you either do or don't remember where you parked your car, and don't, you have a hard time finding it, um, and so on. Um, and though you only had one thing for dinner last night, so you only have one chance to learn that, unless you have the same thing every night, which I guess some people do. But not many of us, hopefully. Um, OK, so that's uh, people. In animals, um, uh, 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 implicit or habit learning or procedural learning are, sorry, in people, sorry, let me start that again. In people, um, procedural learning examples are motor skills, um, including learning to play baseball and so on and so forth. Um, things like predicting the weather. So, that, that was a little confusing, but it's actually a very important one. Um, so um, we all get some skill at looking at the clouds in the sky and feeling the humidity and getting all these cues and predicting what the weather's going to be from that. Well, that um, takes a long time to learn, actually. And the learning that we're doing there is largely unconscious. We don't really know exactly how we do it. We just kind of learn. There may be some con we may kind of look and say, oh, it's such and such. We know You know what it is. And you may also have some declarative learning that's involved with that, but there's also just you kind of know what the weather's going to be like. Um, and that is another example of procedural learning, which has been studied a lot. Not with actual weather learning, but with tasks which simulate. That, you know, we, we mimic that. Um, playing a piece on the piano. Classical conditioning, like Pavlov's dogs, and another kind of classical conditioning that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Those are all examples of procedural um, uh, or implicit learning. In rats, um, uh, a 
good example, and a heavily studied example, is um, uh, learning where you are, or where you need to be, in a situation relative to external cues. Um, or learning to recognize um, a, a particular context or environment as the place where something happens, like maybe that's where you get a shock, or that's where something good happens, and so on. That, those are things that are learned very fast by rats. Um, and they are examples of declarative and episodic memory in rats, and they require the hippocampus. I'll show you the evidence for that down here in a minute. Um, the, um, in rats, uh, uh, um, procedural learning examples are visual discriminations. So for example, if I show the rat a triangle and a circle, and um, it, has, it knows it has, it has to learn to go to the triangle to get food, uh, or something like that. Um, that's an example of a visual discrimination. That's the kind of thing that in a person is probably learned using the declarative system. In rats, it's largely learned using this procedural mechanism that doesn't involve hippocampus and does involve other structures. It doesn't involve basic angular structures. Um, also, in rats, learning motor skills um, is procedural. Now, here is a pic just a very brief picture of the uh, schematic of the, of the nervous system of the relevant parts. So, um, here's the cortex, just going as a box. Here are the basal ganglia. Thing. Here is the hippocampus, and both the basal ganglia and the hippocampus are places that communicate back and forth richly with the cortex. Um, so they both. So the basal ganglia, or I should put, have them the other way around. The basal ganglia are where storage occurs for this kind of learning. The uh, hippocampus is where storage initially occurs for this kind of learning. Um, in the case of this kind of learning, the information is initially stored in the hippocampus, but eventually, over a long period of time, it migrates to the cortex. Um, uh, which means that after a long time, you can lop out the hippocampus and still remember it. But if you try to lop out the hippocampus soon after learning, you forget it all. Um, the cortex, in both kinds of learning, well, sorry. In both kinds of learning, the actual production of responses is due to brainstem circuitry um, that um, is controlled by the cortex, but also to some degree also by the basal ganglia here, when the basal ganglia is involved. Um, and then it's the cortex that receives sensory information. So sensory information comes in here, is evaluated, and it's largely the cortex that produces the behavior, but it does so in consultation with the basal ganglia for that kind of learning and in context of the camp. Uh, I spent a while in New Orleans, and that's, I think I'm still there. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to turn off my radio before. No, 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 it should be on. Wait a minute. All right, I guess it's okay. Um, okay, so the two different structures, uh, this one for <laughs> declarative, that one for procedural. Um, and in rats, there's a very nice experiment that's been done to sort of um, show the difference between these two things. The actual layout for the experiment is exactly the same in both, but they're two different procedures. So for the declarative experiment, where the animal has to learn where something is in order to, you know, achieve something it wants to achieve, um, what you do is, sorry, in both cases you have, sorry, in both cases you have a tub filled with milky water that the animal can't feature. And in both cases, you have two floats floating on the surface. Um, and in both cases, um, you have a triangle painted on one float and a diamond painted on the other. And in both cases, under one of the two floats, there is a little platform. So what you do is you plop the rat in with the mouse. He has to swim around and swim around, but of course he doesn't want to keep swimming. He wants to get, and so he, but he can't see the platform because it's under the surface. But these little bobs, the little floats, are cues for where the platform is. In this, excuse me, in the declarative situation, it is always the platform that is in some fixed location relative to something like a window or some other room landmark. In the procedural um, situation, the correct, the platform is always marked by the local stimulus, by the triangle, and this other, the, the, where the window is is irrelevant, over here where the, 
what the symbols are is irrelevant. So same situation, but the rat's being asked to do different things. OK, now um, let's look at this. Suppose we train an animal, a rat, um, in this sort of situation. Let's look at a control rat first. This is errors of how often he chose the wrong place. Um, and the errors over time, look at the black circle. That's the control. That's the black uh, line. They go down. This learning is pretty fast. It only took seven trial blocks. I don't remember how many trials there were for block of trials, but it probably wasn't very many. I meant to look that up this morning, but I didn't have time. Um, so it goes down. Um, if we make do a different group of rats in which we locked out the basal ganglia, it looks just like pretty much just like the goal. So it doesn't make any difference for this kind of learning. On the other hand, if we lop out the hippocampus, um, we don't get nearly as good learning. Okay. Moreover. Um, if we do the learning with the hippocampus intact, and then right away you lock out the hippocampus, the errors go way up. The animal forgets. On the other hand, if you train the animal intact, wait a month or so, and then lock out the hippocampus, um, then the learning remains. In other words, it's as though the hippocampus no longer had the memory, so it means no longer required performance. Um, and the usual and the belief, the, wi the widespread belief is that it has migrated somehow to the cortex. Um, nobody knows anything. Well, that's not entirely true. One, uh, there, there's a, a, a widespread belief with some evidence that the migration occurs at night when you're sleeping. And some people say it occurs during your dreams, and some people say it occurs during your not dreams. So that's not, I don't think, fully resolved. In fact, it's not really proved that that's entirely what's happening. Something like that probably is what happens. Okay, over here, this is kind of just the opposite experiment. Here we train the animal with this procedural uh, thing. And if you look at the black control curve, it goes down. But now it took um, 15 blocks of trials to get the error to go down, rather than seven. And as I say, I think these blocks of trials are probably longer blocks. Um, if we now, if we do this experiment with the hippocampus locked out, it looks just like the control. But, um, if we do the experiment now with the basal, blank, basal ganglia knocked out, which didn't make any difference with this kind of learning, we don't get hardly any learning. Okay, so that's the kinds of evidence on which these claims about this structure or that structure being involved are part of the evidence upon which it's based. It's the kind of evidence on which it's based. There are lots of other kinds of evidence too, but these are the these were the first kind, and these are an important kind. Okay, two kinds of learning: declarative, procedural. Um, Explicit input. Um, okay, now, what is learning? Clearly, um, something must change in the nervous system, presumably in nerve cells, when you learn. Because otherwise, you know, the nervous system is what the nerve cells, the nerve circuitry is what is responsible for behavior. And if the behavior is different, then presumably something about the nerve cells is different. Um, I once said that to a class, or actually not to a class, to so a student in this class, um, and they were really surprised. That you know, changes in the brain during learning. But I mean, I, most neuroscientists would consider that almost an article of faith. You wouldn't even have to do an experiment to prove it. But it is true. Um, so, what's going on? What's changing? By the way, again, these slides are basically have the same information as the ones that you probably have printed out in front of you, but this morning I fancied them up a bit. So, uh, if you remind me, I'll give you this version. But there's no new information here. It's just I separated a bunch of stuff that was together all in one spot. Okay, what changes when we learn? Well, let's take as an example for our kind of learning Pavlov's dog um, uh, with the salivation. So um, uh, there are various possible things we could use as a conditional stimulus. Um, we bell a light at home, we get some food. Um, so the typical procedure is we pair the food and let's say the bell, um, and eventually the dog, which initially, of course, salivated to the food. There was probably an innate connection here between neurons that were somehow they're activated by food and neurons that either cause salivation directly or cause a thought of food which in turn causes uh, salivation. Um, there's probably a strong connection innately there, but there's no innate connection between the neurons representing the bell, which are somewhere in the brain, and this neuron. But what presumably happens, what people think must happen, is somehow um, Eventually, after we train the animal, 
this bell alone is able to cause that response. So the presumption, or not the presumption, but a reasonable hypothesis, is that some connection is formed between here and here. Now, there are at least two ways that can happen. One way it could happen is um, a new connection might grow, new synapses, the neural pathway that kind of makes the connection. That is what, for many years, people, that, that's what I would have presumed, at least if, if I hadn't thought about it very carefully, that's what I would have presumed it seemed logical. But the other possibility is that there are already connections between all these neurons and this neuron, already there, but they're just weak. And that what happens when you learn is you strengthen the right one. So in this case, you would strengthen the one between the bell representing neurons and this neuron that one way or another causes salivation. Well, the fact of the matter is um, most people now think the second one is what's right. Um, I don't think the final word is, a, you know, it, clearly the second one happens. There's no question about that. And what, that's what we're going to be talking about. That the first one does not happen isn't so clear. I don't. I mean, it's hard to prove a negative. My hunch is that eventually people will discover uh, new connections forming to some extent. Um, but that's not what most people think presently goes on. Even though intuitively it kind of seems like I mean, it seems crazy to think that everything's already connected to everything, and that all you have to do is make the sense of the connection strong. It seems much more plausible to form, assume that when you learn a new connection forms. But available evidence says that's probably not so. Um, or at least there's no evidence that it is so. Not much evidence in itself. Okay, so um, synapses, learning uh, is due to synaptic modification and synaptic strengthening. And the first evidence of that, uh, that, that's just, I, that was now believed, but the, ev the first evidence for that was the discovery of a phenomenon called uh, long term potentiation. There is a very famous uh, neuroscientist, psychologist, by the name of Donald Head, there's a picture of him, who conjectured around 1950. Um, that um, it might well be, well, here's what he said, Head's rule. This is not exactly his words, but it's almost his words. Um, if you have some neurons here synapsing on a neuron here, he conjecture, he said that, that for some such connections between one neuron and another, not all, but for some, some, some such synapses between one neuron and another, he said he hypothesized that if a presynaptic axon fires, and I put in and releases transmitter to the postsynaptic cell at about the same time as the postsynaptic cell becomes strongly repolarized, um, which uh, that's not what he said. What he said is um, what he said is if the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell fire together, um, then the synapse between the active presynaptic neuron and the firing, but he said, I would say he would have said firing, and I'd say the depolarized postsynaptic neuron become strengthened. So if you activate this and depolarize that at the same time, approximately, you'll get a strengthening synapse. That was his hypothesis, based upon absolutely no evidence. But it was a hypothesis that would explain a lot of different things, not just learning, but a lot of other things, too. He wrote a long book called, what was the behavior? Wrote a long book um, uh, telling all the things that this hypothesis would explain. But as I say, no, no data at all. This has more recently gotten summarized by somebody else, a woman named Carla Schatz, to say, to, to, it makes it easy to remember, neurons that fire together are wired together. Now, but there was no evidence. Then, about 10 years or so after he wrote the book, some uh, neuroscientists discovered, basically, that he was right. Um, their evidence was at first indirect, but, but other people following up on it, and it led to the discovery that basically uh, it was right. Um, this strengthening of synapses of the kind that Hebb had uh, conjectured about was um, first discovered in the hippocampus, which is, and the reason it was discovered is people knew by then that the hippocampus was needed for declarative learning, so they were studying it really heavy, heavily. And in the process of doing so, they discovered this phenomenon. Um, and um, it subsequently turns out to be true with lots of synapses throughout the brain. Not all synapses, but there are many synapses at many places in the brain that, uh, ha that, that show this kind of Hebb's, what's called Hebb's rule, uh, namely the neurons that fire together and wire together. And here's some data from, not from the hippocampus, but from the amygdala. And the reason I'm using this example from the amygdala is for reasons you'll see in a minute, it's the amygdala that we're going to be talking about today. Um, Okay, so basically what they did is they did an experiment in which they put electrodes in and, and di directly depolarized some inputs to, uh, to uh, at the presynaptic side of a synapse that they thought should show this kind of change. 
and they directly injected de a depolarizing current into the postsynaptic cells. So they have two electrodes, one to stimulate these guys and cause transmitter release, um, and the other, this is in the hippocampus, um, or in the amygdala. Um, and the other um, was to depolarize this cell as had said you would need to do. And so this red bar is when that was done. And what's happened here is, so here is the EP, there was, prior to doing this procedure, pairing the pre and the post, um, the EPSP produced in uh, the cell that was recorded from um, was, uh, looked like this. And after doing so, it looked like that. That's a trumped up picture, but that's kind of the way the data was. Um, so the EPSP grew tremendously. Um, and here is a graph of the percentage increase over the baseline size over time. And what it does, it goes way up pretty fast. Then it goes down some, but it levels off way above where it started. That's a standard pattern for experiments like this. And notice it's low. And there are, is debate in the literature about how long it can last. Um, I'll give you one second. There's debate about how long it can last, but um, at least probably for weeks and maybe months and conceivably much longer than that. Yeah. Uh, where's the um, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Go back and review your notes. That's going to be on the exam for sure. Um, that's right. If you haven't had the exam, you don't have to study yet. But don't do it all the night before the exam because the lecture I'm giving you right now tells you you won't remember to squat if you do that. Okay. Um, but you probably don't care as long as you do all the exam, but I care. Sorry, what? Um, so in this heptual example, the presynaptic axon that it's talking about is that kind of labeled A? In this, yes. Okay. Well, no, actually, in this experiment, they just stimulate the whole swatch of it. Well, I'm just trying to understand. But yeah, but conceptually, yes, it would okay. be just one. Yeah. Okay. The one that represented some particular stimulus would okay. be the conceptual thing. I'll show you that in just a second. Yes. Um, okay, so it lasts a long time. And this phenomenon is called long-term potentiation, or LTP. And synapses, which do this kind of thing, are sometimes called head synapses. He didn't call them that, but later investigators. Okay, so in fact, um, this is, at the current point in time, what most investigators think that this or something like it is the mechanism for memory in the brain. More things that will no doubt be discovered. In fact, there are some things that have already been discovered, but this is the one that most people talk and think about. Um, now, um, we are going to be talking about a number of experiments that are done with a particular kind of classical conditioning, not Pavlov's kind, where the response is salivation but an aversive kind where the response is fear or freezing. So what you do is you present some neutral stimulus, like a cone of a particular pitch. Um, and right after, you give the rat an electric shock. And um, uh, he pretty rapidly, actually, uh, learns to become afraid of the tone. And he demonstrates that fear, fear in a number of ways. He has an EQ startle response to a neutral stimulus. He freezes, things like that. And uh, in these experiments that I'm going to be talking about, we'll probably really look at the freezing response. Um, so here's a little picture illustrating this. In this case, a light is the uh, condition stimulus, the, the cue. Um, but more often, it's a tone. Um, it's just like a draw a picture of a light better. Um, now, a major success of um, the last 20 or so years of, uh, of neuroscience is that um, the Certain kinds of learning, a few, for a few kinds of learning, the locus in the brain where the changes occur has been discovered. And one, and this is one of, this is actually the really two, this is the one we're going to be talking about. And for this kind of learning, um, the changes are largely in the amygdala, um, which we kind of have alluded to. Ah, yes. Um, this is the picture, I, I gave you some extra pictures to look at um, for studying, and um, whereas my, I don't think my lecture slides have, I'll get you in a second, I don't think my lecture slides have a picture of the amygdala. Um, here, the little right here, kind of uh, in, the, in the front, more or less, of the hippocampus, yes. Do we know if this is conscious? Like, does, would the animal know why it? No, it's unconscious. This is, this is procedural okay. learning. Okay. Procedural learning. And this, the amygdala is kind of classified, it used to be classified, and it's, now it's not usually, but it used to be, it's classified as part of the basal ganglia. Okay. Basal ganglia being the ones that are involved in procedural learning. So it's fast, which is unusual, but it's, uh, in other regards, it's, it's, it's a procedural learning. No, they, they don't have a, presumably, and we don't know what a rat has. But, okay, but I mean, we yeah, yeah. assume that if we did it on a human, they would, they would not, not 
have, be able, well, I can't believe they wouldn't also do some declarative learning and wouldn't be able to tell you, yes, I know when I see the light, it's going to cause a shock. Okay. But that's not, just like with the reflection here, the basic fear mechanism is an involuntary, unconscious thing. So there are probably both kinds of learning going on in fact in humans. I would guess. Um, okay, so in the in the amygdala, what's going on is this: you've got some cell. The amygdala is actually a complicated structure, but just to give you the essence of the thing, in in the amygdala, or at least certain a certain part of the amygdala, there are cells which, when they are active, they cause a fear response. They project downstream and they cause various manifestations of fear. Um, and um, there are a whole bunch, not just one, a whole bunch of them. I just draw one here. And they, in fact. First of all, get innate connections to the neurons that fire when the animal is made to hurt by giving an electric shock or whatever, maybe frightened. Um, and then they receive, so that's, oh, sorry. Oh, right, yeah. Ignore the, the uh, green guy here, pay attention to the red one. So there's a strong innate connection there. Um, they also get input from a whole variety of cortical and also thalamic neurons that represent various neutral stimuli, such as tones and lights. And so forth. Um, and these are represented here. Um, so in these experiments, what you do is you present, well, in the one we, in this experiment here, um, we present a light, it activates, in this case, it would probably be cortical neurons, which are active and release transmitter, but produce a dinky EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential in these cells. But at the same time, or roughly at the same time, we're giving the shock, which strongly depolarizes these guys. And so this synapse strengthens, and it's a head synapse. And so after that's happened, just a few times, maybe even only once, it's very fast actually, even though it's procedural learning. Once that's happened, then the light alone will cause a fear response. That's what seems to be going on. Um, and a little bit of the evidence is what I showed you on the previous slide, that in the amygdala at these very synapses, um, this is what happened. This is one of these amygdala synapses that this experiment was done in. Okay, so um, at least for our purposes, the learning here is in the amygdala and it's due to LPP of these synapses um, between cortical and to some extent thalamic inputs and certain cells of the amygdala. It's head synapse. Yeah? So when you said the shock is, the shock is given relatively soon after, that means it's really, really, really soon after. They're not, okay, actually, I mean, um, this is really not necessary for this class. Usually the shock has to come at least about a third of a second after. The stimulus. It's got to follow. And um, it, it, they're absolutely simultaneous, and nothing's learned. And what's happened, and the interpretation, the, the um, um, interpretation of that in terms of what makes sense for the animal is what the animal's really learning is causality. And so if A causes B, B should follow A, not be simultaneous. If they really occur at the same time, there's probably some third event that caused them both, and that you shouldn't learn a connection between okay. them. Um, the physiological mechanisms for that delay are actually not understood. Okay. Everybody knows so, and it's true for the physiology. Well, it's actually not. It's true for both the physiology of the formation of LTP and for behavior, but quantitatively, it doesn't work out right. There's some real problems here that haven't been solved. It would seem that the suggestion that the EPSP does happen at the same time. The, 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 basically, you have to have the depolarization at least about a tenth of a second okay. after. The, uh, stimu to stimulate those inputs. But in, for the learning, it would have to be more like a third of a second. So it, it doesn't really, it, it, there's a, some quantitative mismatches, and there's some things there that really aren't understood. Um, OK, so um, all right, so that's, so learning then appears to be, as far as we know now, synapse modification of pre existing synapses, which is actually quite a surprise. Um, now, Prior to that discovery, if you just ask somebody what they thought was going on, they would have said, yes, I think learning is due to changes of synapses. That kind of makes logical sense. Um, but I think it's due to growth of new connections. Um, and if um, new things grow, you require protein synthesis, because growing things require proteins. Um, and so um, long before any of this stuff was done, people did experiments in which they said, do you need protein synthesis to get learning? And um, once um, Watson and Crick had discovered about DNA and RNA and all that stuff, um, and maybe even before that, drugs became available that could be used to <coughs> prevent protein synthesis, poison protein synthesis, or stop it, inhibit it. Um, and so these drugs were used 
um, once they were discovered, to see whether it could infuse some of this drug into the brain somehow or into the bloodstream, and then try to train an animal, would he learn? And the discovery was rather interesting and I think somewhat surprising. Oh, so that's, that's what I just said. It was interesting and somewhat surprising. Um, this experiment was not done on pure conditioning. This experiment, these experiments are mostly done in a different way. Uh, or at least not, I should, at least not classical pure conditioning. Um, so it, in this experiment, which is this is one of the very first ones done, um, it was a mouse and it was put in a Y maze. Um, and the floor was electrified, and he had to go into the correct side in order to get the shock to stop. Um, and uh, you could plot um, how often he chose it, so you do it, and then put it back in and see what he did. He learned in this sort of a way. Oh, sorry. And he would learn um, uh, to go to the side, uh, to the correct side. You could then test him at various times after that um, and um, see uh, how well he remembered. Sorry, I didn't mean to think of the wrong one. And what you find out is that testing at 15 minutes after training, 45, 90, or 180 uh, uh, minutes after training, um, he remembered very well. In fact, he remembered for probably weeks or months, I would, I would guess. Um, remembered pretty well. What's interesting, so that's not like that, that everybody knew that would happen. Um, what was interesting about this experiment is that the animals, if you did the same experiment with protein synthesis inhibited, they actually learned perfectly well. They learned just as well as the, norm, as, as the normal animals. But, they forgot over a period of uh, an hour, a couple hours. They started forgetting really fast. They, the memory only really stayed strong for five, ten minutes. Something like that. So the implication of that was you do need protein synthesis, but not for learning per se, only for getting things stabilized, only for getting the learning to go to a long lasting form. Um, this shows exactly the same phenomenon for LTP, in this case, probably the hippocampus, I don't remember. Um, where basically um, here's the normal, oh no, maybe actually this was the very same experiment I talked about before, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, here's the LTP uh, pairing, goes up, um, stabilizes, do the same thing with either transcription or translation block, and they learn, the LTP rather, gets induced perfectly well, um, but it falls off over a period in this starting, very, basically a very similar time course to the one in this behavioral experiment over here. <clears throat> the process of stabilization um, is referred to as uh, cellular consolidation. Consolidation is the word. The word consolidation is used in several different contexts, but this is one use of the word. Um, so for, in both cases, you need protein synthesis to get a long-lasting form of the change. The fact that you need the protein synthesis for both is also um, uh, consistent with the idea that this kind of thing is, in fact, responsible for that kind of thing. Okay, so you need protein synthesis to get long term um, stabil stabilization of memory. This is the, you know, the idea. Okay, now, that being the case, and since we're going after this question of how to improve this, or how not to make it bad, um, in this case, and why it is that well space learning causes this to happen more than mass learning, um, one needs to talk a little bit more about what the events are in the cell that cause um, the uh, protein synthesis, set it in motion. And so that's what the section here is about. Um, and this is going to lead, in, in a very shaggy dogish sort of way, um, to the discovery of something called the cyclic AMP responsive element binding pro protein or PREP. Um, and that's a story I'll start now, and I won't finish it today, I'll finish it next time. Okay, first of all, you've all seen this picture before. Um, this was in the uh, uh, um, lecture that you had to watch uh, uh, the, uh, on, on uh, YouTube um, uh, during the first week of class, that, um, the extra lecture on genetic mechanisms, where we were talking about the fact that genes are not necessarily transcribed, there are all sorts of things controlling whether or not they are transcribed, and there's a short-term form of control which involves these mechanisms. And I've just looked at this slide with some slight modifications from there. So we, you uh, may or may not remember, but I'll remind you. What happens is you have some stimulus to the cell. It could be a synaptic input. It could be something else. Um, and that um, uh, leads to, uh, can lead to the production of an internal signaling molecule, which in turn leads to the tagging of a regulatory protein. Um, 
And then once tagged, that regulatory protein will bind to a particular spot on the DNA, which is designed for binding to that tagged regulatory protein. And that sets the description, that sets the uh, transcription of these downstream genes into motion. If you don't remember that, or it doesn't sound familiar, go back and look at that first YouTube thing. Um, on genetics. In any case, um, these um, internal signaling molecules that are produced, there are a lot of different ones. Actually, not. there are quite a number of different ones. The very first one to be discovered was called cyclic AMP, CAMP. Um, and at the time, and, and so the question was, is something like this involved in setting the protein synthesis that's needed for stabilizing learning. Is this what's this is the kind of thing that's going on? And if it is, you know, exactly what are the molecules that are involved and exactly what are the details of the process? And so since it was a period when cyclic AMP was almost the only second messenger known, people had said, well, is cyclic AMP needed? Well, they were lucky. Turns out it is. Um, that, that turns out to be the culprit, or at least one of the main culprits. Um, and um, so experiments were done with cyclic AMP. Well, all cyclic AMP does is cause binding of the tag to occur to this regulatory protein. If you want to get further, um, be able to manipulate this process, it would be nice to actually have the protein. But nobody had a clue how to get the protein or where, what it was. Um, so they wanted the protein. But what they did know, it turns out that cyclic AMP they, uh, is involved in learning, they discovered. But it was already known that cyclic AMP is, is a second messenger for lots of other kinds of things. It's used in liver cells to control uh, uh, transcription of liver enzymes and in all kinds of cells. And for all of them, it turned out that the sequence in the DNA that gloms on to the tag regulatory program protein is always the same. And, got refer and so it's referred to as the cyclic AMP responsive element. It's not really cyclic AMP that's being bound. It's the thing, it's the, it's, the, it's the regulatory protein that's tagged by cyclic AMP that binds there, but it was called the cyclic AMP responsive element, cyclic AMP responsive element, or CRE. Um, do I have that written down here anywhere? Probably not here. Maybe on the next slide. Nope. Oh, oh I just, okay, sorry, there's something. Eh. Never mind. We'll continue with it next time. I left something out that I, I told you, but I didn't show the, the evidence for it. We'll continue this next time. Not these. Oh, not these. Okay. Right. Um, this is, sorry, there's an un, Okay, well, sorry. There is an earlier version of these, which should be online, and which you also should have gotten email. No? Oh, maybe I wasn't throwing that. I'll check. I mean, well, this don't put anything in your list. Like, it should have been there. Um, yeah. no, it's huh. I might if it's one of those that vanished after I put it up. Um, if you can, I, I think I'll remember, but if you think of it, if you could please um, send me an email reminding me, I've got to do that in the time. Okay, yeah. I, my hunch is it's there, but it got somehow hidden. <laughs> okay. uh, but, yeah, I might have forgotten to do it. Uh, I'm just a bit confused about the half synapses. I mean, okay. Are you, are you trying to say that everything is already Wait, let me turn this off. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an electron Wednesday, right? There is electron Wednesday, yeah. yeah. yeah.